Um, welcome today. I am Dina Blaze. I'm the chair of the Board of State History, and I am delighted to be with you today. I want to welcome all of you to Utah's only statewide conference, focusing entirely on Utah's history. Thank you very much for spending your day with us, and I'm delighted to see such a large crowd joining us today. We're delighted to see all of you. In keeping with our conference theme, the long view of history, I hope that you've already enjoyed an expanded view of ideas and people in the, con in the sessions you've attended this morning. I'm confident you'll also find that our keynote speaker and afternoon sessions to be outstanding. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Thomas G. Andrews. Thomas Andrews is professor and director of graduate studies of history at the University of Colorado Boulder, where he teaches courses in the history of American West, environmental history, indigenous American history, and several other topics. The author of Coyote Valley, Deep History in the High Rockies, and the Bancroft Prize winning Killing for Coal, America's Deadliest Labor War, his work in progress on human-animal relationships in North American history has been supported by the Guggenheim Fellowship and National Endowment for the Humanities Public Scholars Award and several other honors. He is passionate about engaging K through 12 teachers and the broader public in thinking historically, making sense of the present by adopting a long view on the past. Please join me in welcoming Thomas G. Sanders to the stage. All right. How are y'all doing? Whoa. All right. How's everybody doing? Good? OK. OK. Let me, let's see. OK, we're good on the feedback? Yeah. All right, awesome. Um, it's wonderful to be here today. Um, as a Coloradan, it's always nice to get, a, get onto the west side of the Rockies and um, see what's happening over here on the Wasatch Front. Um, I want to thank uh, Jed Rogers for bringing me out here, and I want to thank everyone who helped uh, make this possible. And I'm going to talk to you today about kind of a weird project and really a strange event. And I don't know, I don't want to get too mystical about this, but I, I tend to think that projects find us more than we find them. And so, um, so this is a project that seems to have kind of found me. Um, and what I'm going to do today then is try to give you a sense of, of what I'm trying to do with it. Um, I'm still uh, in early stages, so you're going you're gonna to get kind of a, uh, an early take on um, a few slices of something that I'm working into a book. All right, so between September 1872 and August 1873, more than 90% of North America's horses, donkeys, and mules fell ill with the complaint that physicians, veterinary surgeons, and practical animal workers all diagnosed as influenza. Um, I kind of miscalculated this for a lunchtime talk, right? I'm gonna spend this whole time talking about infectious diseases, so. Um, as you start eyeing your neighbors distrustfully, you know. Um, so marked by a hacking cough, running nose, fever, chills, and prostration, this virulent outbreak began on Toronto's expanding fringe, then spread along rail lines, canals, turnpikes, country roads, and steamship routes. Within a month, the malady had engulfed all of northeastern North America. Just six weeks later, what I call the Great Epizootic Flu had pushed south from Virginia to Georgia and west to the lower Mississippi River Valley. It reached Missouri in late November, East Texas in early December, and Cuba by the year's end. With winter's descent, the contagion slowed somewhat for reasons that I'll return to later in the talk. March nonetheless brought news that one salient of the viral swarm had poured through the Sierra Nevadas into California, while a second invaded the Valley of Mexico and a third pushed across Arizona to Los Angeles. April witnessed, as one breathless news report put it, San Francisco's horses, quote, prostrate with the strange equine malady 
and all of Central America and the West Indies now suffering from this alarming visitation. The disease had achieved continental proportions, but still found new hosts to infect. In summer 1873, it reached its outermost limits, uh, convulsing British Columbia, Mexico's Pacific coast, and San Salvador. Already, the aftershocks of this unprecedented outbreak were rippling through the Northeast, raising fears, mostly unrealized as it would turn out, that a second wave might again paralyze travel, production, and exchange in North America, Central America, and the Caribbean. Together with pneumonia and other secondary infections that followed in its wake, the outbreak would kill around 3 to 5 percent of the equines that struck. The deaths of 300,000 to 600,000 horses, mules, and donkeys caused financial loss and emotional distress. Even though the vast majority of equines recovered from the malady, the great epizootic flu nonetheless constituted a calamity for the inextricably horse-powered societies of the Northern Americas. The physical effects of the illness and the widespread belief that stricken animals could only recover if rested uh, from their ordinary labors combined to paralyze local transportation. Commerce stalled, economic production slowed. Everyday life in the city and the country, in indigenous homelands and subtropical plantations and haciendas alike assumed a carnivalesque character, like a blackout or snow day that lasted for weeks. Wags spilled plenty of ink, mocking uh, this predicament. Um, this was, you know, it, it struck people at the time as, as a very, very odd event. Suddenly a common and usually relatively unobjectionable malady had grown into a monster capable of laying low nearly all of the equines on which people of every sort depended. Yet even as the great episodic flu flouted human-constructed boundaries of nation, region, race, culture, class, and community, it also raised troubling questions. How to maintain economic growth and everyday life without equine labor? How to square existing theories of epidemic disease with the behavior of a, of a complaint that experts at the time readily identified as influenza, but that behaved in ways that, no, that influenza had never been recorded to have behaved? And how to rethink the tangles of dominion and interdependence laid bare by a disease that denied humans of every uh, nation, race, class, and gender recourse to the mode of power, transportation, entertainment, profit, status, and sense of identity that horses, mules, and donkeys ordinarily provided. Now these are the questions that frame the book that I've recently begun in this peculiar, and I'm hoping you'll agree, intriguing disease event. Today though I want to explore a related question. Um, how can what the organizers of this conference call the long view, um, how can taking a deeper perspective on this year-long event help us better understand aspects of this, uh, of, of this epizootic that we might otherwise miss? Now adopting a long view comes more naturally to some of us than others. This is my dad. Um, and he was a, he's a geologist who's devoted a long and still active career to studying climatic and environmental change at the end of the last ice age. Um, although I've diverged from my father's past, I've made more use of geology and the long-term perspective it provides than almost any historian I know. My first book, Killing for Coal, included a section on the formation of Colorado's fossil fuel deposits in the Cretaceous and tertiary. These passages served to root my story of labor conflict in the late 19th and early 20th century Colorado coal fields deep within the earth itself. And that in turn helped me to explain how mining company officials exploited these coal seams' uneven nature to arbitrarily reward some workers with more lucrative underground workplaces, even as they consigned others to riskier, um, to, to riskier less, remunerative, less remunerative settings. Remunerative is a good word to write down, but not a good word to speak, right? <laughs> um, as for my second book, Coyote Valley, it treated the environmental history of the Colorado River headwaters in the century since the creation of Rocky Mountain National Park as but the latest episode in a saga that reached back to the last ice age. This approach allowed me to demonstrate, in turn, that the ecology and landscape of that area had changed more drastically in the century since 1915 more, you know, a century which saw this area preserved under the management of the National Park Service 
than it had over the preceding five or six millennia. Now that I've told you a little bit more about uh, how, how the long run has mattered in my past work, I want to turn into how it's figuring into this current project. Um, and this is, uh, this is the, the, the story of the great epizootic flu. In particular, I want to delve into two different phases of this outbreak. Its dramatic appearance on North American soil that fateful fall, and its diminishing speed on reaching the western expanses where indigenous nations continue to endure in the face of intensifying settler colonial pressures. Together, these portions of the larger project show that even in trying to make sense of a single event that lasted less than a year, paying attention to the long view can reveal all sorts of things worth learning about the human past and the broader context in which it has unfolded. So, first part, emergence. The first clear signs of the great epizootic flu appeared in late September 1872 on the northern outskirts of Toronto, which was already Ontario's largest metropolis. James Law, the Scots-born, Edinburgh-trained professor of veterinary medicine at Cornell, who penned one of two uh, authoritative studies of the outbreak, noted that, quote, unlike the majority of former epidemics whose origin has been obscure, the great epizootic flu appears to have sprung into existence in the center of the North American continent and in a distinct locality, which can be definitely pointed out. The disease Law uh, had learned from his correspondence with another Scottish emigrant uh, veterinarian, Ontario's Andrew Smith, had begun in the townships of York, Scarborough, and Markham, about 15 miles north of Toronto's central business district. Local residents, Smith told Law, first noticed the telltale signs of the malady among horses running at pasture. After reaching Toronto itself on October 1st, the great epizootic flu took just three days to sicken all of the city's equines. What was happening? With the benefit of hindsight, we can sharpen and extend this question. Why did the epizootic start outside Toronto, and why at this particular historical juncture? By the time the great epizootic flu materialized on its outskirts, Toronto had grown into a bustling city of 56,000 people, Canada's second largest and a rising rival to Montreal. It was also home to one of the continent's busiest ports. Significant numbers of horses, mules, and donkeys stumbled down gangplanks that led from sailing vessels and steamboats originating in Europe, the US, and beyond, and onto Toronto's rapidly industrializing waterfront. Now, those of you who are versed in one of the most influential pieces of long-term historical scholarship that's been published in the last half century, the environmental historian Alfred Crosby's 1972 Columbian Exchange, might suspect that these imported equines probably hold the key to answering the question um, that I raised a few minutes ago about the great epizootic flu's origins. The disease, you might suspect, started near Toronto because that's where animals who had contracted the viral infection somewhere else in the world first set hoof on North American soil. Such a hypothesis seems sensible. The astoundingly high infection rate that the great epizootic flu exhibited, uh, James Law, for instance, noted that the percentage of horses attacked has been variously stated at from 80 to 99, uh, but then he added that the latter number, 99%, was nearest the general average. Um, so with this, um, you know, this tremendously high infection rate, um, that tells us that uh, really beyond any shadow of a doubt, North America's horses, donkeys, and mules had never encountered the likes of this influenza before. If they had, or even if the mares and jennies who had fooled them had, then a sizable percentage would have possessed at least some immunological defenses against this viral swarm's assaults. Now, there's a trio of important facts that I think together disprove the hypothesis that the great epizootic flu constituted a virgin soil epidemic. The first of these requires that we take a long view. For at least a century, and possibly much longer, North America's equines, as James Law and many others pointed out at the time of the 1872 flu, had already suffered from both sporadic and epizootic infections of influenza. Indeed, late 19th century authorities claimed that horses had fallen ill during human flu epidemics dating back through the Renaissance all the way into classical times. Second, the townships that the Ontario veterinarian Andrew Smith and others had identified, I think this keeps hitting my mic, um, 
The townships that the Ontario veterinarian Andrew Smith and others identified as the point of origin for the, for the outbreak lay miles away from the city's port on Lake Ontario. Last but hardly least, there's no evidence that equine influenza had reached epizootic proportions anywhere else in the world uh, prior to the outbreak uh, reaching Toronto. Um, so there's not some similar event, you know, say in like Britain or in Cuba that precedes uh, the great North American epizootic. These facts strongly suggest that even though the great epizootic flu of 1872 shared the infectiousness of what Crosby called virgin soil epidemics, the virus that caused it must, in fact, have been homegrown. The outbreak began in Greater Toronto, in other words, because this was where a radically new form of influenza virus came into existence. Um, now, before I try to explain why, I want to briefly highlight a very important implication of this finding uh, for the theme of this conference, the long view. So in European and American historiography, the most influential set of arguments ever made for adopting such an expansive take on the human past, I would argue, originated with the French analyst historian Bernard Brodel, who most thoughtfully championed what he called the long durée, the long run, in his masterpiece, uh, The Mediterranean. For Brodel, the long view mattered mostly because it revealed the deeper continuities that historians too often overlooked in their obsession with, de with detailing the history of events. But whereas Brodel and the rest of the analysis school embraced the long view because it helped them see the continuities they might otherwise have missed, the great episodic flu reminds us that taking a long view is no less useful in determining uh, when something important has changed and when something new has materialized. So in the next several minutes, I want to try to do my best to lay out a plausible uh, and I hope scientifically valid scenario for the great epizootic flu's emergence. Uh, we'll probably never know the full story of this emergence event because physical remains of the virus responsible for causing it um, have not been recovered and probably never will be. The bottom line, though, is that the ongoing evolution of various influenza types, each of which is calibrated to infect several species of birds and mammals, uh, e each type is really um, geared toward a specific species or even a specific uh, kind within that species. So there's this combination, I'm going to argue, that generated a new type of flu, um, or more accurately, what virologists often call a swarm. It's a really kind of ominous term, a viral swarm of closely related types. Um, and these types explain why North America's equines were so powerless. This was essentially a new thing on the earth. Uh, this unprecedented, unprecedentedly virulent kind of influenza resulted, I think, from potent biological reactions midwifed by mixed husbandry farming, waterfowl migrations, equine-powered transportation and exchange networks, and mutable viral genomes. Okay, so let's start small. Really, really small. With the characteristics that have long made the influenza virus so successful against the wide variety of birds and mammals, um, that it infects. Now, viro virologists have devoted tremendous effort over the past century to unlocking flu's mysteries. Blind spots and points of contention endure, of course, their entire journals devoted only to influenza. But the existing state of scientific knowledge um, is good enough to, uh, to allow us to speculate with some confidence that the influenza virus's rapid reproduction rate and its flair for mutation must have played central roles in the great epizootic flu's emergence on Toronto's fringes. Because flu viruses, like most microorganisms, reproduce very swiftly, they undergo much more extensive evolutionary changes on much shorter time scales than do humans, horses, and other multicellular life forms. Uh, no less important, influenza is an RNA virus. This means that it lacks robust mechanisms for ensuring that subsequent generations of the virus remain true to type. Influenza viruses are thus several orders of magnitude, more likely even than, our, than DNA viruses, uh, you know, the, the pathogens responsible for things like smallpox or herpes, um, to experience minor mutations. This process is called antigenic drift. It goes on all the time. It accounts, for instance, for the annoying habit, which we're all about to uh, probably encounter, of seasonal flu to shift in ways that limit the effectiveness of vaccines uh, mass-produced in advance of each flu season. Influenza viruses also fashion more comprehensive genomic shifts, though, because of a process known as reassortment. 
sometimes described as a kind of viral sex, not because it involves flirting over candlelight dinners, but instead because the offspring it generates possess a mix of their progenitor's genetic material. Reassortment can lead to fearsome outcomes. Influenza, like other viruses, reproduces by penetrating the cells of host organisms, then hijacking these cells' machinery to produce copies of themselves. And here's the important thing. When two or more distinct flu varieties try to replicate themselves at the same moment within the same host cell, their offspring's eight strands of RNA can sometimes resemble a mashup of distinct parental lineages. In describing antigenic drift, the process I talked about a second ago, virologists sometimes use the analogy of poor proofreading or copy editing to describe, uh, to, to sort of describe the dynamics. With reassortment, though, you get uh, far more revolutionary results. It's as if an office machine shared by dozens of coworkers uh, went berserk and merged different print jobs pell-mell into a single discombobulated document. Now, reassortment and anti antigenic drift lend flu a pair of mighty weapons in its ever-unfolding battle to overcome host immune systems. When a highly virulent form of flu suddenly appears and swiftly assumes epizootic, and I, sh I, I should explain this at the outset, epizootic is a you know, you think of epidemic, the, the, the demic word in there applies to people. So epizootic is an epidemic that applies to animals. And this is the term that people in the 1870s mostly used to refer to this disease event. Um, so when, when flu assumes epizootic, epidemic, or pandemic dimensions, this usually tells us that, that the virus is engineered a breakthrough in its evolutionary arms race against the birds and mammals whose systems of cellular reproduction the virus must parasitize in its ceaseless effort to reproduce. Like an army surging past the shattered ramparts its enemy had long entrusted to hold the virus in check, the emergence of new flu swarms marks an historical disjuncture, a moment, a moment of momentous and often chaotic change. This metaphor works even better if we carry it just a bit further to imagine the decisive factor in such a tide-turning military offensive as resulting from the stealthy introduction of a new type of weapon from another military theater, a weapon immediately mass-produced and distributed to the massing viral hordes on the eve of their tide-turning offensive. Now, in the case of influenza, viral forms embodying a history of conflict with one or more distinct host species stand out as the most obvious source of game-changing military hardware in the context of the 1872 epizootic. Um, so the swarm of flu types that devastated North America's horses, donkeys, and mules in the early 1870s, then, most probably resulted from reassortment's capacity to meld genetic material from two or more influenza varieties, each of them shaped in fundamental ways by hotly contested, yet previously disconnected evolutionary engagements that unfolded over deep time against their respective hosts. The influenza virus's almost boundless capacity, not simply to shift, but to mutate significantly, and to do this on very short time scales, offers a case study in the limitations of Brodel's conception of the long durée as offering the durable substrate or foundation atop which human, atop which human events have unfolded. Um, a team of infectious disease experts recently pointed out that the emergence of zoonotic viruses, like the one responsible for the great epizootic, is driven by local circumstance, history, and serendipity. And so I want to move here then to, uh, to tell a story about historical contingency that hinges on economic and ecological transformations in metropolitan Toronto over the preceding decades. These changes turn the market, firming, the market farming outskirts of the city into a nearly ideal crucible for a viral reassortment event they combine portions of genetic material from pre-existing flu strains that had evolved to infect equines, and one or more of the following, humans, poultry, or wild birds, with hogs and canines as more distant possibilities. Most mutant forms of flu swiftly perish because reassortment usually introduces fatal flaws into their makeup. This one, by contrast, survived to spawn an unprecedentedly powerful form of influenza, which then began to reproduce and spread, first within the body of the host in which it had evolved, then to other organisms. Um, so what I'm talking about here then is a, is a set of historical accidents, essentially. And these, these begin within one cell in one animal. 
And it's kind of staggering when you think about this. Um, you know, this is the birth of something that in, 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 in all the ways that matter most is new. And it happens on that scale, but then assumes continental proportions. That's sort of the mystery and, the, and, and you know, I think kind of the magic of this story. Um, so the expansion and commercialization of mixed husbandry outside the Ontario capital, together with the growth of the city itself and the proliferation of equine-powered exchange networks linking city and country, together enabled a highly localized reassortment event originating in that single cell, in that single animal, to assume epizootic pr pr uh, proportions, to carry a disease that begins in Ontario all the way, for instance, to Utah, where the disease would reach in January of 1873. And I'm happy, I'm happy to talk a little bit more about what this would mean um, in the Utah context um, during the Q&A. By the early 1870s, Canadian settler colonists had cleared well over 300,000 acres of woodlands, wrested from Mississaugas and other Native Americans in the county of York, which comprised Toronto and its immediate hinterlands. Horses, supplemented by mules and the occasional donkey, supplied much of the motive power used to clear Ontario's woodlands. Farmers then poured into these newly felled forests. They brought with them, as farmers typically did, a veritable menagerie of hogs, cows, goats, sheep, uh, sheep chickens, turkeys, geese, and ducks. Even as farmers, urbanites, and others were damming, draining, and otherwise reshaping how water flowed through the burgeoning metropolis, the area's streams and lakes continue to attract large numbers of migratory birds, which have long constituted the major reservoir uh, hosts for influenza A viruses. So most of the sort of new genetic material when it comes to influenza viruses is actually contained in wild birds. In the course of cutting down forests to build, ag uh, to build farms, Ontarians expose their herds and flocks to the panoply of flu strains, strains discharged from the gastrointestinal tracts of swans, geese, gulls, terns, shorebirds, and perhaps most important of all, dabbling ducks like mallards. A typical ode to the new economic and environmental order that was taking shape in mid-century Toronto praised the transformation of, quote, a realm of forest wealth and tangled growths of interlacing boughs into clearings now open to the sunlight, interlaced with fertile farms and busy, busy industries, as well as a network of railroads, highways, and other avenues of communication. These transportation systems, many of them horse-powered, drew humans, equines, and the full range of other flu-prone flu critters into ever closer, ever more consistent contact. Equines circulated ceaselessly between Toronto's outskirts and the city itself, shuttling back and forth between the concentric, between the concentric rings that extended from the dense traffic and throng of tram cars and other vehicles that you see in this photo, um, all the way out to the logging operations on which the city's dramatic agricultural and suburban expansion um, depended. With every step they trod and every load they drew, horses, donkeys, and their hybrid offspring helped to knit downtown and suburbs, flourishing farmlands and the settlement frontiers beyond into new ecological configurations. Now, so far, I've only presented a circumstantial case showing that flu viruses possessed ample opportunity to undergo reassortment outside of Toronto before the great epizootic. The evidence, though, actually enables me to move beyond matters of context and opportunity. For historical accounts from 1872-73, as well as cutting-edge scientific research on evolutionary changes in, in influenza across species over the long durée, both suggest that this outbreak of influenza reached far beyond equines, and in the process, it left legacy, legacies that continue to trouble us today. The peoples of the Northern Americas marveled at the epizootic's temporal and geographic sweep, but they also puzzled over its bi biological reach. Throughout the flu's year-long career, newspapers sounded the alarm that the malady was jumping from equine populations, including zebras employed by traveling circuses and menageries, to infect poultry, hogs, cattle, dogs, cats, wild deer, bison, and even a newly imported rhino at G.F. Bailey's great 25 cent show in Lower Manhattan. Newswires, meanwhile, carried panicky reports of human infection, like the one presented before the Union Medical Association of Saratoga Springs, of a man who received some of the discharge in his eye 
from a horse, this is a quote, whilst in the act of sneezing, its poisonous influence proving fatal in two or three days. It's gross, right? I mean, horse snot in the eye, and then the guy's dead. Um, most authorities in the 1870s maintained that spillover from equines to humans and other species remained localized, producing dead-end infections rather than a cross-species panzoata. Several recent scientific studies, however, complicate this conclusion. In the process, this research also calls into question the assumption that the variant of flu responsible for the outbreak ran its course, then vanished from the face of the earth. So one thing that taking the long view involves sometimes is having to read journal articles from you know, uh, publications like Influenza and other respiratory viruses. Um, so infectious disease specialists from the National Institutes of Health in this article and in a second piece examined descriptions of poultry ailments in 3,200 newspaper stories from the 1872-1873 period. They described the descriptions of disease that these sources contained as highly consistent with influenza, specifically highly pathogenic avian influenza, um, the, the kind most associated with 20th and 21st century human outbreaks. On chicken farms in various parts of northeastern North America, these scientists wrote, whole flocks were usually struck simultaneously, resulting in rates of fatality at or near 100%. Pennsylvania's German-speaking population even took to calling the affliction, and here you have to forgive my Pennsylvania Dutch, um, Deftern bronchite, which translates as the horse chicken disease. The same researchers noted, quote, numerous individual human cases and localized outbreaks throughout the United States of influenza the contemporaries often associated with exposure to ill horses, as well as several major influenza epidemics, human infections, in 1873. The authors concluded that the flu variant that vexed the continent's horses, donkeys, and mules probably infected other species, too. A path-breaking 2014 study published in Nature, meanwhile, argued that flu underwent a so-called global synchronized sweep in the late 1800s, most likely between 1866 and 1878. Applying innovative molecular clocks that I can't even pretend to understand to genomic sequences sampled from historical and present-day specimens of flu virus obtained from horses, humans, poultry, wild birds, hogs, and even fruit bats, this team identified the great epizootic flu of 1872 as the most likely progenitor of all the influenza varieties that have afflicted the sampled species in the intervening century and a half. What they characterize as consistent, statistically strong evidence shows that avian influenza lineages, with domestic and wild birds being equally likely sources, mixed with equine flu lines during the great epizootic, eventually contributing most of the genomic segments of the 1918 pandemic virus um, and so what they're arguing then is that the, the, the epizootic of 1872, the form of flu whose, um, whose creation or whose appearance I've been trying to explain, this is really a direct ancestor of the flu strains responsible for the 1918 to 1920 human pandemic, which would kill an estimated 50 to 100 million people, um, one of the three deadliest disease outbreaks in known human history. Okay, so landscape scale environmental changes in Greater Toronto in the mid-1800s, to sum up the point I've been making, combined with sudden genetic transformations facilitated by flu's peculiar propensity for dramatic mutation, whenever and wherever several different uh, susceptible host species come into close contact. Um, together, these things set the stage for the emergence of a new flu type. The swarm's very novelty prevented either its initial host or the 10 million plus other creatures it would go on to infect from fighting it off. After infecting other cells with its, uh, within its first victim, this virus then passed to other hosts via the external environment. Parasitizing an ever-expanding network of other critters, it began to spread with remarkable speed and unprecedented thoroughness. All right, now I want to turn to give a second example of how adopting the long view um, can help uh, place the great epizootic flu in a clearer and more revealing light uh, I think you'll be happy to hear that this one does not involve virology and Canada. This one involves um, more directly historical events in the American West itself. So trying to offer a more detailed account of how, um, how and how swiftly this outbreak spread, I noticed this seemingly small but intriguing disparity. 
And that's this, the epizootic really slows down on reaching the Great Plains. Um, so you can boil this down to a pair of statistics, the ones you see here. And effectively what this means is that the, the, um, the, the outbreak de decelerates by about 50% on reaching the West. So a short-term view suffices to offer some explanations for this kind of riddle. The slowdown coincided, for starters, with the onset of winter, a season that saw Westerners of every variety hunkering down and limiting their travel. Compared to the regions through which the epizootic had already coursed, the population densities of both horses and humans were also significantly lower in the West than in eastern North America. Finally, the environmental technological systems so crucial in the outbreak's transmission from Greater Toronto to the rest of the East, had made only limited advances into the continent's central and western reaches. 1869, as you all know, had brought the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad, right? And three years later, this remained the only route of its kind. Steamboats, meanwhile, never penetrated the immense territory between the 100th and 115th parallels, um, at least not in terms of continuous lines nor did horse-toed barges like those that hastened the Great Epizootic's advance through the canal-strewn reaches of Ontario and upstate New York. So this trio of short-term explanations, first, the, the advent of winter, second, low human and equine population densities, and third, poor penetration of the West by modern transportation systems, all hinge on absence. Each treats the West as a negative space defined chiefly by the various ways in which it was not the East, Comparisons are good to think with, of course, but I'm generally not a fan of such lopsided modes of explanation. I care too much about the West, too much about Western history, too much about the indigenous American past, to be content with the too easy argument that things happen differently in the West because it wasn't the East. And so with the time remaining, I want to outline how a longer-term, Western-centric view can offer a more satisfying explanation of the great epizootics, great slowdown. Now the arguments I'm about to uh, lay out unfold on three successively narrower timescales. These correspond roughly but conveniently to centuries, decades, and years. So let's start with the longest of these views. Um, and the key move here involves historicizing the adoption of uh, horses as well as donkeys and mules by indigenous American peoples in the centuries uh, preceding the Great Epizootic Flu. The basic story here, one that, uh, one that most of you are familiar with, is that Native Americans began acquiring horses in the 16th century. The animals then multiplied and spread forth through trading, raiding, and their own capacities for movement, escape, and cooperation. Between the late 17th and late 18th centuries, horses enabled dozens of indigenous American nations to imagine their world anew. The result is N. Scott Mamaday, Elliot West, and many others have eloquently written, was one of the great epics in American history the rise of horse nations in the Great Plains, as well as in the Rocky Mountains, the Columbia Plateau, and parts of the Southwest, California, and the Great Basin. By roughly 1800, populations of unmanaged and human-claimed horses in the West were soaring. The demographic picture for Native Americans, alas, was far less certain. Powerful nations, including the Comanches, Lakotas, and Diné, continued to grow in population. Overall, though, eruptions of smallpox, measles, other pathogens, probably influenza itself, were combining to take a, te a heavy toll, especially among more sedentary villagers, like the Mandans that my colleague and good friend uh, Lil Fenn explores in her Pulitzer Prize-winning encounters at the heart of the world. Now, as historians, we need to remember that the long view is important not simply because it can provide us with answers, but also because it can provide us with questions we might otherwise fail to ask. In the case of the all-too-brief century-scale flashback I've just presented, two such questions stand out. First, why were indigenous North Americans and their horses both declining in numbers by the time the Great Epizootic Flu reached the plains in winter 1872? And second, how might the drastic transformations of the 1800s have limited the scope, intensity, and frequency of the horse-powered movements on which indigenous lifeways throughout the continental interior had come to rely. Answering these questions requires that we turn from centuries to decades. This narrow timescale enables us to get our heads around the world-shattering effects 
the growing trade dependency, worsening environmental impacts, and wave after wave of epidemics unleashed on indigenous American societies throughout the West. The details varied significantly, and these differences matter, uh, mattered a great deal. Sedentary villagers suffered more than mobile bison hunters. People whose homelands lay far from US and Canadian salience of settlement fared better than more isolated counterparts, and so forth. By mid-century, though, the contours of a more broadly shared reality were becoming clear enough. Populations of indigenous people were declining throughout the West, often drastically, and in some cases, even catastrophically. This brings us to another benefit of adopting a long view. It turns what we might mistake as historical givens. In this case, the low population and scanty population density of the West relative to the East takes these givens, these supposed givens, and shows us that they're actually historical questions requiring examination and, explore, and, and explanation. The ferocious military campaigns unleashed by settler colonial states between the California Gold Rush and 1872 played both direct and indirect roles in the changes that slowed the Great Epizootic Flu. Indian Wars decimated indigenous American populations, pushed, pushed bison herds uh, uh, toward collapse, and curtailed the movements of tribal communities. The US Army, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, and similar outfits also played an under-acknowledged part in undermining Native people's once uh, prodigious holdings of horse wealth. J.E. Welch, a soldier in George Armstrong Custer's 7th Cavalry, later recounted this fatal logic in his published recollections of the 1868 Washita Massacre, an atrocity that claimed the lives of dozens, perhaps more than a hundred, Cheyennes and allied peoples. Having located the camp of the Peace Chief Black Kettle in present-day Oklahoma, by stumbling across its horse herd, Custer ordered his men to attack. The commander then, Welch claimed, uh, ordered his men to, quote unquote, set fire to the lodges, totally destroying them and their contents, end quote. And then finally, Custer ordered his men to shoot, quote, the ponies of the herd, which had been captured in spite of the efforts of the women to run off with them, end quote. Although Welch called this a most unpleasant and repulsive duty for the soldiers, he agreed that there was no alternative. And so the whole herd was slaughtered, an estimated 875 ponies in all. In a mournful tone that contrasted dramatically with his gleeful recounting of Cheyenne casualties, Welch uh, remembered that it took an hour and a half to kill all of these horses. Uh, slaughtering Indian horses is the aftermath of the Washita shows, constituted a key tactic in settler colonial efforts to neutralize indigenous independence and resistance. By the time the Great Episodic Flu reached the plains in December 1872, it was penetrating a realm convulsed not just by serious demographic collapses among indigenous peoples and the equines they claimed as their own, but also by a cascade of invading settlers, fragmenting ecologies, and intensifying campaigns of control and containment by the US and Canadian governments. The suite of changes conspired in turn to further circumscribe the long-standing mobility of indigenous horse nations. Um, there's two main strands here. One, uh, two main things that I that I um, you know, that, that that I want to lay out. The first involves um, dwindling bison numbers. So by the early 1870s, the state of uh, the West bison herds was such that most indigenous nations were no longer hunting buffalo. And so bison had long been a key motivation for mobility among indigenous peoples, as indigenous peoples essentially uh, cancel their bison hunts in the late 1860s and early 70s um, and turn toward other subsistence strategies. They travel less than they did before. Secondly, horse rating declines significantly during these same years. Um, it declines partly because of the control that US and Canadian government agents would exert over reserves and reservations. It declines because there's growing fragmentation of, of native nations, there's growing separation between them. And, um, and also, you know, is, is the horse wealth of various nations declined? There were fewer and fewer incentives to raid. So um, what these things meant then uh, was that, you know, um, the, the sort of uh, decline in buffalo populations 
the downturn in rating essentially aggravated the, uh, the sort of all, all of the other factors that were circumscribing indigenous mobility. What this meant then, I think, is that by the early 1870s, native peoples are traveling less frequently. They're not moving as far. There's fewer situations where people and horses from different parts of the West are coming into close contact. And I think that that's key to explaining why the Great Epizootic slows when it hits this part of the world. All right, so by now, I hope I've made it clear that I'm a big, big fan of the long view. It's been integral to all the work I've done as a historian, and it will inevitably remain at the heart of all the research and writing projects that I'm hoping to complete before my working career drives to a close. In two sets of historical problems that I've explored with you today, uh, first, the puzzle of why the Great Epizootic Flu first burst onto the North American scene in the sleepy environs of Toronto in the fall of 1872, and second, the riddle of its deceleration um, on reaching the Great Plains um, a few months later, I've tried to combine deep, medium, and short-term explanations. This approach to time, as I hope my, my previous books show, um, basically kind of resembles how I, how I look at geographic scale. I think when we're thinking about scale on a geographic basis, we try to integrate the local, the national, the global. And with time, I think it's similarly important to move across time frames, to think about them together. Now, uh, a parting thought. If a long view is useful in raising the questions and the explanations that we historians love to explore, then it's downright essential when it comes to the all-important task of figuring out why the arguments we make and the stories we tell about the past actually matter. I'm talking here, of course, about significance. Let me illustrate this principle by returning to a point about the Great Epizootic Flu of 1872 that I already made in passing. Separate teams of evolutionary biologists and infectious disease specialists concur that the form of influenza that first materialized in Toronto, then engulfed all of the Northern Americas, was almost certainly the direct ancestor of the strains responsible for killing 50 to 100 million human beings nearly half a century later, not to mention a precursor of virtually all of the flu strains that currently prey upon the world's birds, um, porcine species, bovine species, canines, and of course humans. So viewed in the short run, the, the great epizootic seemed like a joke, it seemed like a fluke. It's a curious and inexplicable visitation that prompted some alarm, considerable irritation, and more than a little derision. From the vantage point of the present day, though, we can see it more fully. For all its ridiculousness, the flu of 1872, it turns out, was also a harbinger of modern plagues, including AIDS, Zika, Ebola, and Dengue, all of which emerged from the continuing co-evolution of humans, other than human animals, and rapidly evolving microbes in contexts of quickening global exchange, accelerating ecological destruction, and the, and the incessant desire to survive, even at other organisms' expenses. Um, so on that upbeat note, I'm going to thank you all for your attention, and I look forward to seeing what questions you have. Thank you. Um, 
real upswing in cross-species infections of various sorts. And, um, and that's something that's not simply affecting human populations, but you, know, you, can, you can sort of pick your species, and, um, and in most instances, you'll find that there's some new kind of pathogen um, afflicting them. You know, I mean, we could, we could take the long view then and say, well, is this something new? Is this a, is this a new um, set of circumstances? Um, or is this kind of continuous with what's happened in the past? I would say that it's a little bit of both. I, you know, I mean, just to, just to speak in broad brushstrokes, I would say that, um, you know, of course, humans and, and, and other creatures have always shared infections. Um, what we're seeing in recent decades, though, with many of these emergent diseases is that there's, there's an intensification of that process. And that's associated with people, you know, with sort of um, shifts in where people are living, um, expansions in human population, and, um, and a number of other factors that are kind of in, uh, increasing the frequency and the intensity with which pathogens are circulating between, between different kinds of species. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, have, have virologists been able to map the reassortments that have, that have taken place um, and, and kind of create a genealogy leading from 1872 to 1914, uh, to, to 1918? Um, they have, in that, in that second article that I cited, the, the, the one in Nature, they create a kind of phylogenetic tree um, trying to posit how this might have happened. Um, there are a lot of unknowns, you know, because since there's not, um, the, the oldest flu viruses that we have at present are from the 1918 pandemic, where as many of you are, were aware, I mean, actually, the two of the guys that I cited, the ones who did the study involving the newspapers and poultry infections, um, one of them was instrumental in exhuming corpses in Spitsbergen in, in Norway, and uh, pieces of the flu virus responsible for 1918 were actually intact and recoverable from those, from those human bodies. Um, it doesn't seem likely that there's gonna be any genetic, you know, any actual flu viruses recoverable from this earlier period. And so they've, you know, what, they, what, what these scientists have done is essentially use molecular clocks to create a plausible tree. Um, but as for definitive evidence of, of where the branches were, or even what type, uh, of flu, the 1872 outbreak really was, that remains somewhat uncertain. So part of it is speculation. Yeah, yeah, part of it is speculation. There's a lot, of, um, a lot of really refined statistical methods involved in this. And, and of course, that's one of the risks, right, of, of, of adopting a long view and doing the, doing the kind of work that I keep trying to do is that um, I'm a historian, but I'm trying to read Art, you know, journal articles in geology and in virology, and um, and so I have to try to reach out to, to people who know more than I do, so that I don't get too much of this wrong. Um, and and that's you know it, the good part about that, of course, is it gets us historians talking to, to other people and shows that the pursuit of human history really involves all the disciplines in some fashion or other. Thank you. <laughs> yes, yeah, so the question was, I, uh, my, my, could I reflect on my comment that this project chose me? Um, yeah, why would, why would sick horses exert some kind of appeal on me? Um, it's just so weird, you know? I mean, it's just such a weird event. And, and, and what, what stories have previously written, you know, what they previously emphasized is is the weirdness of it, and the fact that this is a, it's a continent-wide power outage, basically, you know? And so, life gets upended for three weeks, four weeks, sometimes as long as six weeks. And it's, and it, and it, and it rolls, you know? And so there's this kind of, it, it, it's just a very kind of peculiar natural experiment, in some ways, of what's laid bare when animal power sources are removed from the mix. Um, so that's what got me into it. But then when I dug more, I started wanting to know why. Like why, you know, why was this so infectious? Had horses in the Americas um, suffered from this kind of thing before? And you know, it, it was sort of a, a, 
I think I kind of reached a critical mass of where I thought I found enough questions that other people hadn't examined that I thought would be interesting. Yeah. Um, on a more, I, I, and on a, ver on a very immediate and practical sense, I've been working for, uh, you know, in some ways like seven, by some measures, 10 years on this idea of writing an animal's history of the United States. There would be this big book on human animal relationships from pre Columbian times to the present day. And I wrote hundreds and hundreds of pages and researched all these different chapters, and I just like I just despaired that I could actually pull it off. And so, on a practical level, I really like something that lasted a year. <laughs> As a high school history teacher, I taught a panic related to some history. Yeah. Do you think that there were economic uh, economic? Totally. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, so the question is about, um, you know, when you think of 1873 as a U.S. as a U.S. history teacher, um, the word panic is usually associated with 1873. Um, so, what what were the economic effects of this? I mean, this is the this is one of the things I really like about this. Then is there's a lot going on in 1872, 1873, and so this coincides with the presidential election where Grant is running against Greeley, and all hell is kind of breaking loose in terms of Reconstruction politics. Um, this is partly responsible for the Great Boston Fire, which is the second uh, the second worst urban conflagration after the Chicago Fire a year earlier. Devastates a whole um, a whole section of Boston's commercial district, and many contemporaries. Um, you know, so I mean, I, I found all sorts of sources from the mid to late eighteen seventies that actually invoke the epizootic as one of the contributing factors to the panic. I mean, most scholars think of the panic as a you know they they, they take a financial explanation of it. But what I what I look at is, you know, so you've got, I mean, literally every community in the country, its economic production is, is decimated for a month, give or take. And then you think of the network effects, right? So, I mean, when New York's devastated for a month, every place that depends on New York, which is every place in the country, is feeling some kind of pain from that. And so, I, you know, I, I think it's totally plausible that there could be, you know, at least a few percent downturn in GDP just because of this. Um, and then you think of like the spillover effects from that. Um, so yeah, it, you know, there's also, a, it, it, this intersects with the Apache Wars, with the Modoc War, um, with corruption scandals actually in, in Mexico, the US, and Canada. So part of what I'm doing here then is I'm kind of using the epizootic as a tool to look at a critical moment in North American Okay, so the question is about um, would I comment on the on the self-imposed myopia of disciplinary boundaries? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not a. Um, I like to have it both ways. Um, what I mean by that is is that you know I think there are contexts where historians are the best judges of other historians, where historians are the best colleagues for other historians. So you know, for instance, when it comes down to the level of like you know, should my university get rid of its departments? In that context, I'm all for historians hanging out with historians. Um, when it comes to explaining the past, though, you know, my own approach is, 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 is virtually always interdisciplinary. I think that the divides really are artificial. One of the appeals of, of looking at human-animal relationships, of course, is that it decenters the human. And um, you know, so, the, so the idea that history is only about people, I think, I think at this point is, um, is, is pretty rickety. You know, I think at this point we realize, like, well, actually everything has a history in some fashion or other. And when we want to get beyond human histories, we especially need those other disciplines. Yeah. How were the dead horses disposed of um, at the time of the at the time of the episode? Um, and, and I'm sorry, I don't think I understood your sec the second part of that question about about live viruses. Um, were the horses still contagious once they were dead? On that, I'm 
I'm not entirely clear. Um, so I, I should know that, but I don't right now. <laughs> um, that's a good question, and I will, I will try to figure it out. I mean, one of the things here is that this is really, most of the horses that die, at that point we're talking about a co-infection because they were initially sickened with flu, but as most of you know, it's actually fairly rare to die directly from flu. Virtually always, um, you know, some bacterial infection that then causes pneumonia. So there, there might also be different answers for the virus versus the bacteria in those dead animals. As far as disposing of the, of, of the dead horses, um, in cities, what this led to was a big upswing in business for rendering plants. You know, so by this point, you have, a, you have a whole industrial economy built around the animal byproducts. And so the horses, uh, the, ex, the extra horses, um, you know, they, 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 they were in the streets for longer. They were decomposing in the streets. But eventually, they would end up in the rendering factory. Their bones would be used for you know, knife handles. Their fat would be turned into you know, possibly margarine for people. Um, you know, this is this is long before the Pure Food and Drug Act, right? Um, yeah, I mean, in, in terms of the countryside, I'm less clear on what's happening to the dead. Um, I think they're probably just, you know, being being left for scavengers or sometimes being buried, but I'm not sure. Um, that's that, that's a good question. I'm, I, I have been I have been wondering about that, but haven't come up with all that many answers in terms of the countryside. Do you have time for one more? Or Okay, why don't we do one more? Um, I'm going to go further back over there. Um, I'm not a historian, I'm just a wannabe, I'm a physician. Oh. Back 40 years ago, when I was still in medical school, when we talked about anogenic shift and drift and the, the influenza epidemic that happens every year, and it's worse. It's all about starting these pigs in northern China who live in homes with people, and then people get it, and then it spreads throughout the world, which I think is just fascinating. So, the, so, so, the, um, so two points. First, um, first about vaccination, and then second about um, about hogs and, and you know sort of hot spots in terms of in terms of twentieth and twenty first century reassortment events. Um, so on the on the point of vaccination, yeah, I mean, what, all I was trying to indicate is is it's antigenic drift mostly that helps explain why. In any given year, the vaccine's effectiveness is, you know, less than 100 percent, right? And how much less than 100 percent is sort of a product of of, um, of how accurate the forecasts were, as well as how um, how subsequent events play out. And and there's an aspect of contingency and unpredictability in all of this. Um, so you know, certainly the the benefits are manifest. So I, I wasn't trying to indicate that the, gif, the, the, the drift renders vaccination useless. Far from it. Um, and then on the, on the recombination point, yeah, I mean, there's been there's been a lot of, um, and, and I'm I'm only partially up on it. Um, there's been a, from what I gather, and I hope I'm not getting this wrong. I think there's been a bit of a rethinking about about the importance of of, of swine in all of this. My understanding is that a lot of the more recent work points to hogs actually getting human forms of flu, and then they become kind of the mixing vessels for reassortment. And so it's a little bit different than they're, they're, they're necessary to the process, but they're not actually, um, they're not actually like as, as, as culpable <laughs> um, or, as, or as central as, um, as you know, the, sort of the, the story that I had learned before. Yeah. Well, um, I'm sure other people have questions, so feel free to come up and, and, and ask me after the talk. And um, thank you for thank you for uh, letting me present something in such an early stage. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.